Thank you so much. It's a, a rather beautiful, effusive introduction, and I only wish my wife were here to hear it. Um, I'll be treated a little differently at home. Nevertheless, she always brings me right back to earth, which is great. Well, we're going to spend a little bit of time together, and I'm going to divide our session into a number of sections. Firstly, I want to look at the nature of human personality, human motivation, and I want to understand what it is we mean by the differential between spiritual and physical. Then I want to move into a consideration of the idea of being able to master the various attributes that we've been provided from above, and in so doing, introduce the modality of meditation um, in a specific manner, because the word means so much in so many different tongues and so many different nuances. And then finally, I want to learn from you. And the only way I can learn from you is if I hear you speak. So I'll we'll have an opportunity to share, and I welcome that opportunity, because that's when I glean the most of my learning in my life, listening to you and hearing from your experiences. And yes, as Rabbi introduced, we are living in rather unique times and challenging times. But then history is replete with challenging times. It's just that our consciousness in any one lifetime reads them as unique. Of course, there have been plagues before, there have been economic crises before and the like, but that doesn't necessarily assist us. In fact, a lot of history just doesn't assist us. Uh, you might recall the uh, wisdom teaching, the one thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. And therefore, you and I are experiencing the challenges in our own right for the first time. So let me begin by understanding why do we register it as a challenge? What is it that makes us feel a sense of overwhelming fear at times? Why is it that we become so partisan in our approaches as if we're grabbing onto the lifeboats of security by opting definitively for certain things, whether it be political candidates, whether it be the way that we perceive the a sickness, the illness that's currently seems to be in society. We are very definitive in everything that we say because we need to have a surety about things. What is it about our mind that reads reality in certain patterns? So let me begin in this way. Five seconds before a person dies, and please God, we should all live to 120, but five seconds before death, our ears hear perfectly. And then five seconds after we die, our ears don't hear anything. Our ears don't hear anything. Now, you would answer to me, of course, death has occurred. But what do we mean by death? That's only just an overarching uh, a, a macro description of something. It doesn't explain to me why my ears have stopped hearing. Of course, we must understand that there's something that's changed in the interim. But yet, our ears, as far as the integrity of the physicality and biology of the ear is concerned, has remained intact. The ear hasn't decomposed five seconds after death. So we have to look for the missing link. And if we want to talk in very general terms, we'll say the missing link is there's some life energy that seems to have left. That's a very, very uh, general kind of description because we can't be exact, because we don't know. Therefore, within the Jewish spiritual teachings, we pose a model, a model that says that that spiritual energy that courses through the body will attribute the name neshama is what ultimately animates the body. In other words, the wonderment of the biology of the ear of itself is insufficient to register the human experience of hearing. There needs to be some energy flow that flows through it, and it's gone AWOL. It's missing in action. Death has, uh, has taken place, likewise with the eyes, likewise with the brain. 
Now, the brain is not a, a mystical notion. The brain is a very complex piece of biological engineering, a wonderment in the way that it operates. It's able to, at the one second, synthesize billions, literally billions of different processes in the body to maintain homeostasis. In other words, to maintain who we are at the very moment. Nevertheless, that too has stopped operating at the moment of death with no decomposition within seconds of death. So once again, the missing link. So what I'm going to conclude is that we are a duality. We are the product of two elemental aspects, an animating force, which for the sake of the discussion, I'm gonna call Nishama, and the physical body that is able to process that energy and express it in the world. We are only in a position to connect to the world, to connect to each other through thought, speech, and behavior, machshava, dibur, and ma'ase, because of the synthesis of these two. Now, coming back to my original question, who are you really? Are you your body? Or are you this animating energy called the neshama? And as far as we're concerned in our teachings, very clearly, you are your neshama. You are not your body. The body has been provided us as a vehicle, as a tool, a spiritual like automobile, except that it's physical in its own right. And the better that we can keep the body intact, we call that health and wellness, the more optimal is our inner personality expressing through it. Now, the divine accountant has given us the particular body that we need to traverse in this reincarnative feature of life, which is this lifetime. We are reincarnated many, many different times called Gilgul HaNefesh. We're given this body. We're given this set of parents. We are given this environmental setting. We are provided with this cultural milieu because that is exactly the test of this lifetime that this animating force, the Neshama, has to express in this lifetime successfully. I'm going to restrict myself in this discussion primarily to the body, not to the wider aspects of uh, culture and environment and even parental influence. So conclusion number one, we are dualistic in the way that we approach the world. Should God forbid aspects of the machinery called body fail or have shortcomings, then our personality, our inner self can't express optimally. And it doesn't have to be dramatic. For example, take tiredness. What does it mean to be tired? To be tired means that the animating force of the neshama isn't able to express as ideally through the body because the machinery has wound down for some reason. Let's take a step further than tiredness. Unconsciousness. If a person is, God forbid, unconscious, the dislocation between the neshama and the guf the soul and the body is even more pronounced. And as we said earlier, along that same spectrum, you have the other phenomenon of death. And death means a very severe dislocation between the soul and the body, not a total dislocation. How do I know it's not a total dislocation? Because the body still has shape and form. In other words, there are still forces in play to maintain the molecular structure of the body, the van der Waal forces. But underlying even those molecular and atomic and subatomic forces lies spiritual energy to animate them. But by and large, it's been removed. And therefore, the body is inert. If we injure ourselves, the arm is broken, God forbid the neshama can't express through the arm. 
the machinery is no longer operational. That does not mean that the potential in the neshama for the movement of that arm has gone away. It's there. It just doesn't express in a world of time and space. Second part of this discussion, in terms of this neshama, this soul, this animating force, how does it find its way into our individual bodies? So let me pose to you the following model. The neshama is a spiritual umbilical cord, not unlike the umbilical cord that joins a fetus to the mother in the womb. And as long as the fetus is fed through the umbilical cord by the mother, everything is fine. And then the baby is born and that umbilical cord is no longer the medium for the continuous provision of life through food into the body of the child. However, the mother continues to feed the child, if not through the umbilical cord, in a much more overt, practical manner. Let's go back to the soul. The neshama is a spiritual umbilical cord. It flows through from the very point of its origin, which is God, right through multi-level worlds, olamot, until it reaches this rather strange atmosphere of time and space. Time and space is really very thick spirituality, so thick that it is perceived as physical. And therefore, the spiritual umbilical cord, as I said earlier, needs a physical medium to express it. But it continuously animates us. It's as if Hashem flows our spiritual food and we remain in Hashem's womb. That's the analogy I'm posing to you. And that force continues. When death takes place, then no longer does that spiritual umbilical cord extend fully into this realm of time and space. But you still exist. After death, you are still you. Your innate, your innate personality still exists. And it may reincarnate again in a different body and present differently as a consequence. So the neshama continuously, if you will, feeds us, animating us. Third property. The neshama uses the body for a purpose, a higher purpose. It's not just inhabiting the body. It uses the body to reach out. Now, why do we say reach out? Because if you ask yourself, what is the primary motivation of human endeavor? What makes us tick? What makes us get up in the morning and move through the day? And you will recognize after analysis, it's wanting to enter into states of oneness with the world. We constantly want to connect. And the most powerful expression of this connection, we call love relationship, the relationship of love. All relationships are our attempts to connect with the world. Our neshama wanting to connect with the world and move into states of closer proximity, becoming more and more one with each other. Let's go back to love, which I've discussed with perhaps some of us in, at my previous sessions. What is love? Love is, if you like, two people drawing closer and closer together in the course of time so that they connect more and more and more. That means the neshamas are meeting and connecting. Do you remember the first connection that's described in the Chumash? We just uh, read about it in last week's parasha. The Adam Yoda Eschava, and Adam knew Eve. What a quaint expression. Adam knew Eve. It's as if the Torah is being shy 
of expressing the obvious that Adam has sexual relations with Eve. Why is it beating around the bush? Why isn't it expressive? And the short answer is it is. What does it mean to know something? If I ask you, what is seven times six? And all of you will jump up and say 42. Most of you unthinkingly bypassing the brain. You just blurt it out. Why? Because you know it. If you were to say, oh yeah, seven fours are 28, seven five, 42, you don't know it. You know how to work it out, but you don't know it. To know it, it is you. So when it says Adam, Yodas, Chavan, Adam knew Eve, it means Adam and Eve were one, united in every respect, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and bodily, physically. So it's much bigger than simply sexual intercourse. It's a total connection. And this is what is our primary motivation. With each other, with knowledge, with the world, we call it curiosity. But curiosity is simply a word we use that ultimately describes the spiritual flow wanting to reach out, which it can only do through the body in this world, and connect. And that's why the recent uh, results of research at Harvard University that were published last year as to what is the uh, what are the most pertinent components of happiness. And the singular factor that was head and shoulders ahead of any other in terms of happiness was relationships, quality of relationships. And we know this through Hasidus much more deeply. Quality of relationships means the way that my neshama reaches out and wishes to intertwine and connect with everything in the universe, whether it be people, whether it be the animal kingdom, whether it be the plant kingdom, the inanimate world, information. That's what drives us constantly through life in every shape and form. So what do we have now? We have now the recognition that we are a duality and that spiritual umbilical cord of the neshama has to navigate through the body. Unless the body is in good shape, healthy and well, then that navigation progress will be compromised. And furthermore, now we know the object of the neshama's quest and search. And you and I will call a successful quest happiness. In the space of, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes, we've probably covered what the nature of life is. And it's not awfully difficult. It's true that university courses make it seem difficult and hundreds and hundreds of textbooks and popular works make it seem difficult but it's not difficult at all. And once we know the goal, then we can manage to be able to achieve it. But then there's some further complications in achieving it. What about something called ego? What do we mean ego? And I'm not using it in the Freudian sense. I'm using it in the common sense. My sense of self, so now I'm going to complicate the model a little bit further. When that spiritual umbilical cord flows into me, it's as if it splits into two strands. Two strands of the same soul. One is real, one is an intended illusion, divinely created. But put that uh, thought aside. The two strands are orientation of self, focus on self, my needs, my wishes, my security. And the other strand is altruistic. The other, you, the world, contribution, sharing. These two seemingly equal and opposite tendencies govern everything we think we say and we do. 
We call the first one Nefesh Bahamis, our animalistic self. Not putting animals down. Animals can be wonderful and majestic, but animals have a certain limitation in terms of their prowess into the world. It remains physical. It's instinctive survival. We have that too. We have that primal aspect of the animal within us. We need to survive. Food, clothing, shelter, as Maslow's hierarchical model will promote. And they're legitimate. You cannot survive without food, clothing, and shelter. There's nothing intrinsically bad about our animalistic soul or our nefesh bahamis, as I'll be referring to it. However, the problem is it doesn't have any limits. How much food? How much clothing? What degree of shelter? When it comes to food, I need to only eat hot cuisine, only what Master Chef provides. Nothing less will do. Clothing. I've got to have a designer label. I've got to have at least 30 outfits so that one day when I need that particular one, I'll have it ready there. Otherwise, I'll feel inadequate. Shelter. Well, I've got to have a dwelling that's as beautiful as the mansion in Gone with the Wind. And if it doesn't have the pillars in the front and chandeliers in every room and chandeliers in the toilet, it's inadequate. In other words, the Nevesh Bahamis continually wants more. I need more money. Why? Why do you need more money? I need more assets. Why do you need more assets? Think about it. It's a quest for security. Nothing wrong with that. However, you can never guarantee security. And therefore, that quest can go on and on and on and dominate people's lives and towards right to the end, never be satisfied. And you and I know people like that. They need more and more and more of everything. That's the Nefesh Bahamis. Fortunately, we have an opposite tendency of altruism, which more or less says to the lower self, you need only so much, now switch and use your energy for much higher order things. Things like gratitude, things like contribution, things like sharing. And if I were to ask you, do you remember moments in your life when you felt really happy, really fulfilled. And I have no doubt that they will have been moments where you are sharing with loved ones. Because our sense of sharing and giving and contribution of the higher order self, the Nefesh Elokis, is the true self. That's where happiness lies. The constant quest for security leads to unhappiness. Or as Shakespeare says, that way madness lies. So now we have superimposed on our earlier model, this particular competitive spirit within, which we call inner conflict. We're conflicted. And mostly at all times. And when we're most insecure, the conflict becomes even more so. Therefore, the kind of partisanship that I from Australia witness in the American political arena, to me, spells high degrees of insecurity. It means people have to opt and compensate even more strongly to fill the void that somehow insecurity plays within. And therefore, non-rationally, they keep opting for a candidate. And the notion of discourse and the notion of discussion goes out the window in a cancel culture. So you can see how these models play out in the reality of the world. Likewise with COVID. We hear two sides of the story constantly. 
the danger and you have to be sensible because it certainly has a higher death rate. Its morbidity level is much higher. And therefore, if you have underlying issues or are of a certain age where perhaps your immunity is compromised, you have to be much more careful. Therefore, we will lock everything down and thereby stop the economy because life counts more. Now that's a laudable aim. That's certainly quite an overtly sensible position, except that we latch onto that without looking at some of the aspects of it that don't fit in. Like the death rate in certain age groups is almost nil. Or that the fact that we lock down is ruining more lives than COVID might. Or the fact that here in Australia, where we've been Baruch Hashem highly protected, and have suffered only 600 deaths, only each death is tragic, but 600 deaths. But we've had the most severe lockdown in the world. We're currently in our homes. We're not allowed to travel more than five kilometers to go shopping. We're not allowed to have anyone in our homes whatsoever. And we're not allowed to leave our homes otherwise. Fine, we've protected ourselves. But did you know that last year in Australia, again, there are the stats I know, many more people than 600 died from pneumonia. And don't talk about deaths on the road, many more than that, several thousand. So proportionately, we have to ask ourselves what we're doing. Now, this isn't a discussion of what's right and wrong. I'm just indicating how partisanship, how insecurity forces us to opt for positions and hang on to them and not allow to discourse to take place. And therefore relationships founder, societies become split and our quest for happiness becomes eroded. That inner conflict that I spoke before between our Nefesh Bahamis and Nefesh Elakis plays out on the big stage of society. I'm going to pause now because what I've done in the session so far is to try to promote a model of who we are, why we operate the way we do, and how that plays out on the wider stage of my contribution to life itself. Of course, in the 30 minutes that I've spoken, it's very unlikely that I've been able to traverse every aspect of it. And uh, I merely scratched the surface. But here's an interesting point. I've spoken from a Jewish spiritual vantage point on notions that are discussed at length in the fields of psychology, sociology, sociology, political science, and onwards. And yet within the pithiness of a Jewish spiritual model, we've already developed a way of being able to look at these things. And this is amazing that in our own backyard, of course, that backyard has existed a long time, three and a half thousand years. And therefore, the opportunity to have it refined has been unique amongst Jewish people. But we have a model. And all I'm asking you is, at this stage of life, look into our, your own backyard and see how the information there is able to compete or at least address the wider information that you've gained over so many decades of either formal study or informal, informal gain of information. Now, let me turn to meditation and I'll explain why. To be able to master becoming an altruistic person rather than a selfish person to be a person who has the security of giving and sharing rather the ins than the insecurity of withholding and developing a fortress mentality. How do we master that? Because habit has taken over much of our lives. When I say habit, what I'm referring to is something quite physiologically understood today. When you think a thought, it means 
that your neurotransmitters in your brain are following a certain pathway between one nerve end fiber in a cell to another nerve end fiber in the cell. When it's traversed, that is a thought. Okay, it's simplistic the way I reduced it, but that's basically correct. And we can see it on screen. We have the technology to be able to view how different thoughts create different neurotransmitting pathways. Now, when you think something over and over and over again, the ease of traversing that pathway is much more pronounced. When you think a thought over and over again, you will think it over and over again. Therefore, if you've habitually become a negative, insecure individual, it means that you have trained negative pathways within the brain to repeat themselves. And they become embedded and become your default and become your habitual response to reality. And that, if you look at yourself introspectively, as I do, we find many such instances. Some of them we don't like. And we say very lazily, well, that's who I am. These are my genes. This was my environment. This is what culture has done to me. I have to accept myself. No, you don't. In fact, you shouldn't. Those things you don't like about yourself, you must change and work at changing. So negative thinking, pessimism, darkness, leading to depression, God forbid, is highly undesirable. How do I undo it? So I'm not at all attuned to the Freudian approach. I'm not at all interested as to what were the childhood circumstances that somehow made that impact to make you the way you are. I am not interested in that. I know you can spend years on the couch of a Freudian psychiatrist trying to work out what it was in your childhood that makes you in your teenage that makes you in your adulthood and still after 10 years not be quite sure and still not having not having changed i take a behavioral approach which means i'm going to do things to change my patterns that are embedded habitually and how do i do that i change the way i think and speak and do and mainly in reverse order. I change the way I behave. I change the way I comport myself. At Mount Sinai, when Hashem offered us the Torah, we said, Na'ase We will do it, and then we'll try to understand what's happening. But first comes action. You can't learn to swim from a PowerPoint program. The only way you can learn to swim is to get into the water. The only way you can be a practicing Jew is to practice it. The only way that you can change is by the doingness of life. So I change what I do with my hands. I change what I do with my words. And that in turn changes what happens in here. But a simple way. One method that I counsel a lot of people who find their thoughts moving negatively or wake up three o'clock in the morning and can't go back to sleep and uh, all these kind of phenomena is I call displacement, thought displacement. Now, God created us in a way that we can't think of two things at the same time. Have you noticed? You cannot have two thoughts in exactly the same instant. Now, you can oscillate very quickly between thoughts, backwards and forwards, but you can't think the same thing in the same moment. Now, that's a wonderful asset. It means that if I don't like what I'm thinking, I can displace it with something else and get rid of it. Simple as that. So when people, for example, come to me and say, hold on, I, I, I just can't get these thoughts out of my mind and I just can't uh, move away from fear of the future and what have you, I ask them and I take them through meditatively a process where they relive very happy, highly motivating moments of their life. And we work through all the sensual aspects of that thought through the five senses. 
and we work through every momentary emotional exhilaration and we keep reliving it and we practice and I tell teach the person how to practice it three times a day for a month and then they have a slide which they can slip into their mind as needed and then I teach them how to have a repertoire of several slides and therefore whenever a negative thought pops in they're able to displace it with ease and thereby break the circuitry of the brain break the habitual pattern by laying down a new circuit and the old one fades weeds start to grow over that pathway and the new one becomes dominant we do this meditatively so i'm just giving an example so i'm going to take you now through a couple of meditation exercises for the next 10 minutes or so one of the things that uh, Rabbi mentioned in his introduction is that we're living in a moment in history where stress is particularly high. And I've explained perhaps some of the dynamics, how we stress ourselves and why without using the word itself. So we need to be able to have first level playing field. You can't create change without first getting back to yourself, colloquially speaking, a level playing field. The use of focus on breath is a useful tool. It's used in many different contexts. It's used in the context of uh, 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 modern medicine. It's used in the context of spiritual endeavor. Why this focus on breath? A, it's repetitive. So it's an easy thing to focus on. But in the Jewish teachings, the Hebrew word for breath is neshima. The Hebrew word for soul is neshama the same source. Breath is the first level of the expression of the soul. And through the biofeedback loop, change the way you breathe, you change the way that the soul courses through the body and through the brain. So you're able to create what Herbert Benson called the relaxation response. Then I wanna take you through a visualization, call it a slide. A visualization of positivity, a visualization that allows you to perceive yourself in a much better light, given the kind of things that we are afraid of today. Okay, assume a posture of symmetry with your feet uh, on the ground and your hands resting on your knees and thighs. Back fairly straight head well balanced on your shoulders and gently close your eyes and just become aware of how you breathe quite normally gently breathing in and out and I'd like you to breathe in and out through your nose. And make the breaths deep and slow. And as you breathe in, become aware of the temperature of the air that enters your nasal passages compared to the temperature of the air that leaves your nose. Slow, deep breath, nasally in. Slow, deep breath out. And just note that the air entering the nose seems cooler than the air exiting from your nose, which seems slightly warmer. And just keep focused on that temperature differential. Slowly, deeply breathing in, slowly and fully breathing out through your nose. 
and with your next breaths, direct the breath once it enters the nose down to your abdomen. And the way to do that is as you breathe in, simultaneously extend your abdomen out, collecting the air there, and then pull your tummy in to expel the air. So try that, breathing deeply in, expanding your abdomen, collecting the air there, then pulling the abdomen in and breathing out. This is a little counterintuitive, so you need to practice it, directing the air all the way down. As you breathe in, expand the abdomen and practice that for a few breaths. Slowly and deeply. And just become aware how in the space of a few short minutes, you have relaxed your body and found a semblance of inner balance. And as you breathe in and out, allow the breathing to be smooth and rhythmical. Let's lend a rhythm to the breathing. We'll breathe in for a count of three, hold for a count of three, and breathe out for a count of four. So take a deep breath in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. In, two, three, Hold, two, three, out, two, three, four. Rhythmically, smoothly, gracefully, a perfect cycle, round. And now let's segue to the second exercise. Become aware of a light source in the middle of your head. A gentle source of light and warmth. Feel it in the middle of your head. It glows gently, pleasantly. It glows a little stronger, providing light within your headspace, a very gentle, pleasant glow that becomes a little stronger. So it begins to filter down through your neck into your torso, chest area and back. Feel the glow of warmth enveloping your chest and back from the center of your head Extend that glow in your head. So now it flows down to your limbs, thighs, legs, feet, toes, pleasant glow, pleasant warmth. 
through your arms, wrists, hands, fingers. Enjoy the pleasantness of the warmth flowing from the center of your head. Increase the intensity a little bit so that it begins to glow through your skin, creating an aura around you. That pleasant glow now enveloping you. This is the glow of your higher order self, the Nefesh Elokis, residing in the brain and flowing through your body and creating an aura around you, an aura that protects you Feel that sense of protection all around you, which we call the Magen Abraham, Abraham's shield, shielding you from all things that might invade unpleasantness hurt, pain, protecting you, deflecting, intensify the aura even more so it begins to envelop everyone in your home. in the area, your family, your friends. Allow it to radiate into the world, making the world a much better place through your individual contribution. Become aware again of the source in your brain, that glow, that pleasantness that radiates, protects you and contributes to everyone. Bring your focus back to your breathing. Gently breathing in through your nose and breathing out. Cooler air entering, warmer air exiting. Begin moving your fingers and your toes, wherever you might be. Move your fingers now, move your toes. And when you feel ready, gently open your eyes, coming all the way back to our session. Everything feels much better. You've covered a fair amount. There's always more. And I have to leave a little bit over for next week. 
See, I don't know very much. So I have to spread it out over two sessions. So I'm leaving some of it still within me to share with you. Um, but I'd love to hear from you. Um, so feel free now to uh, raise questions, thoughts, share. And by the way, I've put up on our chat screen my email address. Um, why? Because I produce uh, three minute meditations on a daily basis. And if you'd like to uh, receive them, um, you have to email me and give me your cell number because they come on a WhatsApp. So do email me if you'd like to receive it. And I've also noted there in the chat, uh, my book, which Random House kindly published for me, if you'd like to develop some of these thoughts further and understand them better than what I've been able to convey today. But Rabbi, why don't I hand it over to you now and give us the opportunity to uh, learn from everybody. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, Rabbi Wolf, thank you so much. Enlightening um, the spiritual discussion of body and soul and the meditation. I don't know. I feel very, very relaxed right now. And it's a fantastic meditation. So I also want to mention Rabbi Wolf's book, Practical. Oh, Practical. Thank you. <laughs> um, I use it all the time and uh, it's a tremendous book. So we'll, we'll do a few minutes. I think uh, maybe five minutes or so of, of Q&A. Does that sound right? Let's do about five Good minutes. Luck. Yeah, I think about five minutes of Q&A. Um, so if anyone has a question, uh, yeah, Richard, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, every time I, I've been led through guided meditations and people say, uh, find that bright light in you. I can't find a bright light. When I'm by myself and sometimes I rub my eyes, I'll get a, a light so bright, like a diamond in my head. I have to open my eyes because I think I'm going blind. But when someone says, I'm leading for meditation, I, I can feel the warmth, but I just don't get the light. <laughs> I just don't get the light. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's a statement. I, I don't know how to put in a form of question. I, 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 I'm i sure yeah. right where wrong would it be. I just I don't, I don't get the light. There's no um, right and wrong here. And right. different people have different aptitudes. And some people's aptitudes oh. in the area of visualization is better than others. And there are different formats of focusing. The common denominator behind all meditation is focusing, but the modality of focusing and what you focus on can vary. And because I led a, a, a meditation based on visualization, it may not have suited you and that's fine. And perhaps next week, what I'll do is I'll lead a meditation that doesn't have visualization element. But on the other hand, the first part of our little uh, exercise, the relaxation response exercise, perhaps you're able to uh, uh, assimilate that much better because that is a non-visualization aspect. So don't feel it's an inadequacy on your part. It's your personality, it's your nature, it's your attributes. And we're all different in that regard. Can I ask you a quick follow-up question? And very quick, I know there are other people. When I do get that extremely bright light in my head, it usually it's, is it physiological? I mean, I'm out of a shower, I'm rubbing my face, and I get this just intense bright light. You know, I don't. Is that just no? Like, but yeah, what just, is it? <laughs> just okay. accept it. It could be anything under the sun. It makes yeah. no difference. Just yeah. say, hey, isn't that a wonderful phenomenon? I'm getting all this bright light suddenly, but I wouldn't ask too many questions about okay. it, honestly. Very good. Uh, there's endless possibilities, and none of them are hurtful. All right, let's let's uh, let's take some more questions. Uh, we'll do a few more questions. Muriel, go ahead. Yeah, Rabbi. Uh, both, hi, Rabbi. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to let you both know, all of you know, that I just had a really amazing meditation. And when when Rabbi said, uh, wrap yourself in protection, um, it was my daughter who died 30 years ago. And it felt, I felt her arms around me. And I'm trying not mm -hmm. to cry talking about it, but it was very, very strong. This was, um, I've done guided meditations many times over the years, and this was probably um, the most incredible one that I've ever done. So thank you for bringing that's, it to us. Uh, that's, uh, that's wonderful that you share 
something so deep and intimate uh, with us. Um, yes, um, it, the, the idea of moving deeper within allows those things that sometimes are recessed to come to the fore. And sometimes we're surprised by what can come to the fore and we start to be able to look at it again. Um, but at the same time, as some people ask me, what does this mean? I'm not sure that I would ask a question, what does this mean? We just say to ourselves, isn't this wonderful that I've been able to uh, 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 get together with my daughter again after all these years and it is a wonderful gift in my life. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for sure. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Not at all. Some more questions, comments. Yeah, Vlad, go ahead. Uh, thank you both, Rabbi Solish and Rabbi Wolf. That was wonderful meditation. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've been doing uh, guided and unguided meditation for a while, but how do how do we connect more with God during that time? Um, stick around and find out next week. <laughs> uh, I, I don't want to uh, uh, shortchange you, though. Um, we have to have uh, a common language which we need to develop. We have to find out what we mean by the notion of God. Um, we have to find out what it means to find God within ourselves. What's the difference between my soul point and godliness as such? Is there a difference? Um, and is it possible for a finite human being with a defined dimension to the brain of eight inches by 10 inches by 11 inches to possibly be able to uh, become understanding of something which is outside of definition? Um, that's another question. Do we have another modus vivendi, another mechanism of connecting which isn't through mind? And might that be a pathway? What do we mean by uh, um, a connecting directly from the soul and bypassing mind and emotions? What are emotions? I've just raised a series of questions which I want to tackle next week, but they are spot on. That's an Australian expression. They are right on um, uh, the question that you asked, which I cannot answer at this very moment because we just haven't developed the background. But I love the view behind you. All right, excellent. Um, let's do one more and then we're going to okay. close it out. Uh, Toba, go ahead. This is a technical question for a change. I've written in on the chat, my number, how do you send it? Okay, so the short answer is um, I can't see it on my chat for some reason, but it won't work. If you put your number on the chat, it won't help me. You physically have to email me on oh. my email the number. So, um, email. and the, it's, it's, is it on the chat there, Rabbi? Or did you come in late and maybe it wasn't, uh, didn't appear yet when you were uh, that is, that is possible. What I'm going to do is um, I will recopy it and paste it to everybody once again so that everybody here should be able to see it. It's, it should be coming up in just a minute. Thank you. I've, I've yeah. beaten you to it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> That's okay, fine. And uh, yes, you'll receive it, as I said, on WhatsApp um, on a daily basis, except Shabbos. Great. So I want to thank you very much. It was a wonderful opportunity rabbi to meet wonderful people and to once again have time together with you albeit briefly and i look forward to a continuation next week thank you and i want to mention the topic for next week uh although it was uh kind of the questions that are at the heart of the of the topic were just mentioned by rabbi wolf but specifically the name of the topic is the four letters that create the world god's name and how the world exists so uh, all very important items. So join us next week, same bad time, same bad channel, um, eight o'clock next Monday night for session two of the Spirituality and Meditation Workshop. By the way, if you enjoyed it, please share the information with a friend and encourage others to, uh, to join us. It is certainly a, uh, a worthwhile experience. Robert Wolf, thank you. Um, I'm not sure what day, day you, but whatever day it is, take it Tuesday. Enjoy your Tuesday. Um, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Rabbi Solis. Thank you. Be well. Be well. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care, everybody.